Hey everybody, welcome back to the One's Ready Podcast. You're in the team room. Trent and I are here living the dream on a Saturday morning and joining us today uh, by a very popular request is Snooky. Now Snooky is a special missions aviator and a lot of you guys have been pinging us about it. So we figured we'd uh, we'd have one on since we happen to know one. So Snooky, welcome. Appreciate you joining us. Happy to be here. Happy to discuss the small career field with you guys. Yeah, man. So, um, first off, give us a little bit of background about yourself, uh, and then we'll go right into some of the the frequently asked questions that we get about the the special missions aviator, or the SMAs, or the SMAs. Because you're, we're just gonna keep saying saying all that, and everybody's gonna be like, "Well, what the hell's the SMA?" So now you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, born and raised uh, just outside Hershey, Pennsylvania. So Hershey chocolate. Uh, Pretty much decided when I was about 16, 17, I wanted to join the Air Force because I wanted to fly. Uh, when I walked in the recruiter's office, I pretty much said, I want to do this job. And I pointed to an aerial gunner ad or I'm not going to join. And so I sat in that uh, MEPS and did the debt and all that stuff for about a year until I actually joined. I was about 2012 and then I joined, went through all of our training, which is about a year and a half long. Uh, moved out to DM where I met my wife, uh, in FTAC, uh, deployed multiple times, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, opened up the weird Turkey, Syria border thing, and then moved out to, uh, Kadena where I was in Okinawa for three years, did a lot of Korea trips and then, uh, came out to the weapons school in 2020. Yeah, and you've been out there with me, uh, ever since I joined the weapons school anyway, <laughs> did time. you, did, but, since we're talking about it, did did you always know about the weapons school or? Yeah. So uh, when I first got to DM uh, Davis Monthan, I was surrounded by a couple of weapons officers that I like was really interested in taking my career field towards the tactics side of it. Everybody knows that you can either go towards tactics or more towards like the uh, AFIs and the standing out portion of it. Uh, I really wanted to focus in on the tactics and. When I uh, got to DM, I noticed that there was a weapons school where there was enlisted people there, but we didn't have a course yet. Uh, so I kind of wanted to stiff arm that, but a course uh, popped up. It was called Advanced Tactics Course in 2016, and I did that in 2017. And ever since then, I wanted to get back to the weapons school, uh, and then we finally opened up an advanced instructor course in 2021. So is that where they issue the man bun for the first time? Is that the weapon school or that, is it like a, a, they, a one or the other thing? That is where they gave me the uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory hair tie to keep the hair out of my face when I'm flying. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so like as like general background, like what was it about SMA that uh, really got you SMA? I'm sorry, SMA. That really got you interested when you were like 16 or 17 years old. Was it like something you saw? Like how did you even find out about it? Because like you said, it's a pretty small career field. Yeah, so... It was uh, prior to 2013. In 2013, uh, we merged the career fields of flight engineer and aerial gunner. Uh, I joined in 2012 as an aerial gunner. Uh, what really drove me to that is <clears throat> I happened to be looking at YouTube videos of flying. That's all it was, was flying in uh, on the airforce.com. And one of the videos that came across was a helicopter. And I was like, what? Helicopter? That's weird. Never seen that before. And then I, uh, I stumbled down the path of seeing that there's guys that are flying on that helicopter that shoot guns. That sounded pretty sweet to me. And I started digging into it from there. Yeah. So like, so w when you get in, like, what was the training? Like I did a little bit of research. I think I looked at SMAs and there's a height requirement so that we all know why peaches <laughs> is not an SMA. Yeah. But like w what's, what's usually like, for, like as we walk through it, you know, civilian to, to coming in, what's the, the sticking point for most people that you've seen uh, just trying to get in the front door? Uh, generally, what we do is it's kind of gone in waves. So when I first joined, only aerial gunners could be high school to flight school. Uh, what I mean by that is you couldn't join uh, and be a flight engineer and directly get onto the helicopter. You had to uh, be a cross trainee. So you couldn't um, even be on half of the helicopter. So we had a very small footprint uh, initially of coming in directly from high school or uh, just in general, uh, directly into the military. Uh, now what the sticking point would be is our, is Manning. So as people start to like join and I feel like 
what I've heard because I have a few recruiter friends is that people want to do the job and then they kind of get stiff armed away because they're like, oh, you'll have to wait for a while to join if you do that, or you'll have to, you'll have that's that training is going to take a while. But in terms of the training, uh, outside of basic training, you'll stay in Lackland and you'll go through aircrew fundamentals, which is a few weeks of just kind of just talking about basic aircrew or basic uh, flying uh, rules in general. Then there's a, a basic special mission aviator course, which is kind of like the hands-on uh, tests, hands-on. Can, can you meet the uh, knowledge requirement that'll, that'll come once you eventually get to a flying uh, portion? Because they want to make sure that you have that capability before they just throw you in the seat. Uh, then we'll, we'll do the SEER uh, as most uh, flyers as well as uh, ops guys do. And then... <clears throat> If you're on uh, helicopters, for example, because there are uh, a few other things that you can do, CV-22s and AC-130s as well, uh, what you'll actually do is you'll go to uh, Ruck, Fort Rucker and you'll fly on the Hueys and you'll get a, an air sense. We want to make sure that you're not going to get sick in flight. You can actually talk to a crew, you know, like these simple things that we never thought about before, but it's actually like a sticking point for people because uh, some people get on the helicopter for the first time and just start throwing up. You can't do the job if you're throwing up the whole time. Uh, <laughs> you can't? Yeah, no you way. <laughs> can't do the job. You would, you'd be surprised how many people are, are throwing up. And then, well, we actually go out to uh, Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, and that's about a year of training where you're actually learning the, the HH-60, for example, and uh, getting an air sense. That is wow. Did so like I, I'm obviously all about the aesthetics, right? Like, so when do you get your flight suit? You know, because like these are the oh. things I want to know. Jared sent me a whole bunch of questions from Instagram. I'm like, I don't care. Like, where's the man bun? And when do you get the flight suit? And how awesome is yeah. it the first time you put on a flight suit? Uh, <laughs> I got my flight suit. I want to say about five months into the training. So after the basic uh, stuff at Lackland and after Sear, uh, you get your flight suit uh, to look cool. Uh, I still got a picture of my first time in a flight suit so it is actually uh, a warm moment <laughs> it is comfortable yeah I like that i mean there's no denying it's comfortable uh, i can't say i've ever gotten sick on a helicopter i mean i believe me i've i have felt terrible doing low levels on a c-130 <laughs> like absolutely awful but i've never been sick on a helicopter even when you and i were out there doing the uh you know we'll just call it the, the other type other flying against some some fifth gen stuff like I wasn't sick on that either. Uh, some some people have never hit some. We were actually out with the ASOS uh, from Germany. Uh, we were doing some training in Boise just this past uh, month, and a few guys were kind of getting woozy and kind of needed a break in between. So it it hits people differently. That's weird. Yeah, well, I hear you. So you would you kind of touched on it a little bit. So SMAs are not just for 60s. What other aircraft do they do they fall on? And and with that, so like the follow on question would be, can you jump from aircraft to aircraft? Like I, not like, oh, I'm done on the 60. I'm just going to hop onto a 22. But like, you know, are you stuck, if you will? Like once you pick that path, are you on that one aircraft or can you go to other ones? Uh, you you actually can. Uh, it's not simple, but you can definitely do it. So uh, you are within the one alpha nine career field. So as a one alpha nine, uh, which is our AFSC, you are able to technically go between uh, aircrafts. But what you'll have to do is go through the initial qualification training for that aircraft. And let's say you've been flying for 10 years and now you want to jump to an AC-130, for example, you would have to go through their full training in order to get it. And of course, you would start at the bottom. So we have AC-130s, uh, you are pretty much loading a, uh, the 150 and you're helping in the back of the AC-130, which is actually a, a, a pretty cool gig. Um, we have CV-22s, uh, essentially what I do. So you're a gunner in the back or a flight engineer in the back. Uh, we have HH-60s, both the Golf and the Whiskey. The Whiskey is the uh, new coming online helicopter for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, we're only now starting to get them at Nellis Air Force Base. And then we still have Hueys uh, pretty much working around DVs out in uh, D.C., for example, flying a lot of politicians in the, and some other, other, some other places that have uh, requirements for Hueys as well. <laughs> I, I got to admit, the Huey is fun to... Uh 
to fly on. So the guys that are actually loading the 105 are SMAs? Yes. Their SMAs? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I, I figured that there was a whole nother AFSC for the dudes that are back there loading. So it used to be. Uh, what kind of happened was when we decided to merge the flight engineers and the aerial gunners on 60s, uh, the AC-130s pretty much merged their loadmasters, quote unquote, and their aerial gunners. So now their their SMA is actually uh, loading the ammunition and being responsible for what's going on in the back. Okay. Would you call them multi-capable airmen? Is that what happened? As you guys were just ahead of the curve, just throwing AFSCs together. <laughs> It's like we can we can just do more. Is that is that too too much? Uh, it's on the nose. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's definitely on the nose. I don't know if I would say multi capable airmen because once you decide to merge two career fields, something's going to fall off. Uh, unfortunately, in our career field, what I saw immediately was what fell off was kind of the tactics side, and we kind of led towards the flight engineer side where everybody was focused on engines and hydraulics and all these things. Now that we're getting to a point where we realize that the the future is dark and we kind of need to know uh, a little more of the tactic side, we're, we're starting to bridge that gap uh, back to being more of a balance in between. But when you do merge and you become a multi-capable airman, something's going to fall off. Dude, I love that. The future is dark. Give me, give me back on the gun. The future is dark. You know what I mean? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so, Hey, one, one more on that, Snooky, uh, real quick is, do you get to pick like which airframe you want to go to, like, you know, straight in when you, when you, you know, graduate base training or not even graduate base training, when you are at the recruiter and you pick that one alpha nine, are you going, okay, I'm going AC, I'm going sixties, I'm going 22s. Uh, no, actually how that works out is once you go to, uh, it's now basic, uh, special mission aviator. So after that aircrew fundamentals and basic special mission aviator in, uh, Lackland, you'll fill out a dream sheet. So dream sheet, just like everybody else, you pick pretty much where you want to go. And based off of what you learned and what you know, what they're going to tell you what's at each base, that's kind of your, your dream sheet is kind of selecting not only where you want to go, but what you want to fly. Uh, for example, I kind of, when I was a young airman, I was 18. I picked off of the locations. I went Florida. I went, Oh, Japan. I went England. I didn't care what the hell I was on. I just wanted to, be in the cool spots and I ended up getting my number five choice, which is Tucson and everything worked out. So it's weird how that happens. Is, is, so it, do you get preference based on your performance or is it just uh yes? Yeah. Uh, Cause sorry. that's something we all, we're right. always telling people, you know, cause we're like, we have like the swowy thing where they all come in kind of open special warfare and they're like, well, how do I guarantee that I'm going to be, you know, combat control? Cause I love peaches. And I want to be just like peaches someday. It's like, well, <laughs> me too. If your performance is there, then you you have a lot more say over what happens, right? Yes. Uh, I don't want to say all the time because there will always be that manning, like, hey, we need people in this platform. That will always yeah. come back to uh, rear its ugly head. But, uh, yes, based off of performance, generally you kind of get stacked in the class and you can kind of – if if you say, I want to do CV-22s and you work hard to do CV-22s, it's going to be hard to deny you CV-22s. Yeah, you got to be ready for the opportunity, right? So if you're at the top of the class and the opportunity strikes, you're, you're ready to go. I wanted to talk about one of the things too, like you said, people talking on the mic, right? In the aircraft, on the mic, talking to the air crew. That's one of those things that I don't think we think about because I've, I've seen it on our side of, of the fence as well. Like the first time you get someone talking to a, an actual aircraft and for some reason your brain just doesn't understand that that's just a normal conversation and people like start doing weird things and they can't speak English. It's How, how often do you see that out there? Uh, people, people want to replicate whatever they saw in movies. So they go directly off of independence day when the guy's taking his mask off and just yelling, uh, <laughs> it happens uh, that you want to say it's a normal conversation, but then everybody knows we also need to kind of use brevity and bridge that gap in between, uh, in order to actually, actually effectively, you know, accomplish the mission. But yeah, there's a lot of people that go way too far the other side. Yeah, it's a while. And for all those people wondering, he is referencing, I believe, the 1995 movie Independence Day, which is a phenomenal movie. And if you awesome. haven't seen it, go check it out. It's, it's the only alert. Independence Day movie. We just win. So, you know, yeah, it's the, the only one that matters. <laughs> exactly. 
So, yeah. So we're, we're, we're going to get a lot of questions about all this stuff, but like as you go through the training and, and you, you, you get out to, to DM and, and you start working towards it, like what was the moment where you actually understood what your job was and you know, like it became real and it became awesome. You know, I re- like I like to go to the, why is your job so awesome moment and then kind of work from there. Uh, that's a really good question. So when I first showed, <laughs> when I first showed up to uh, DM, uh, my flight chief walked up to me and he said, "Hey, Airman Schwenk, you're not allowed to talk to me until you start working hard, and you showed me that you want to be the best." And I was like, "Sure, sure, cool, tech sergeant." And this guy did not talk to me for four months. One day, <laughs> one day he pulls me into a bar uh, at the squadron. He pulled me into the heritage room. Sorry, and. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just careful. decided to be like, Hey, uh, you know, I've noticed you've been working hard. We're about to go to this, uh, training in 29 Palms, California, which if anybody's ever been there, uh, it's totally great. Uh, so we <laughs> head out there and we're doing this training and I want to say I shot 50,000 rounds of 50 cal. And that's when I was like, this is, this is legit. In about two weeks, I, every day, all day, just from the helicopter, shooting at different targets, working with Marines. It was awesome. So it's, it is more than, I mean, Hey, 29 palms copy. Got it. Vacation spot there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it, it has palm palms in the name, yeah. but, uh, yeah, <laughs> Airbnb, but you guys are doing, you guys are doing more than like, Hey, shooting guns. Love it. Like all day long, I will shoot guns. But what is another aspect of the job that's extremely important? Cause I mean, you're doing more than shooting or loading guns. You're doing more than doing height call out, you know, on, on landings and stuff like that. So what are some of the other aspects that you guys are doing that are really critical to really the success of, and we'll just call it sixties since that's what you fly on. Yeah. Uh, I would say there, everybody's always going to look at the admin piece and be like, uh, you know, I have to do admin, but that keeps the helicopter flying. So one thing we have to do is weight and balance. We have to make sure that the helicopter is, uh, actually centered in its gravity. So if it's, if it's too heavy in the back, it's not going to fly correctly. If it's too heavy in the front, it's not going to fly correctly. Same thing like that. So we balance all that out and we come up with our, our power capabilities, right? Because as we're, one of the cool things that helicopters can do is not just fly, but we can actually hover and be in place and be up to a hundred feet or so off the ground, uh, recovering somebody. So another thing we get to do is recover people and we operate the hoist in the back and the hoist is a 200 foot uh, cable that's coming out of the helicopter and actually hooks on, uh, to any individual, or we send down a strop, uh, with that, which is just a, uh, a horse strop that goes around the person's chest and we can actually pull them up. Uh, we bring them back in the cabin and uh, get them squared away. We work with some awesome teams, but we are kind of like the linchpin in between those teams, right? Because the pilots are focused on the flying portion. We're kind of focused on the recovery portion. So we'll work with obviously some badass JTACs, but we work with pararescue all the time. We work with Navy SEALs all the time. Like we get to work with so many cool people just working within our helicopter. Then some of the other awesome things we get to do, especially uh, where we're at now, is we get to uh, kind of take it a step further and go fight these different things to see how the survivability of the helicopter uh, would actually match up against some of these different uh, things that may be out there. Another big part of our job outside of shooting guns and operating hoists, uh, we're actually like focused on our communications. So we're in charge of the crypto capability of not only how we're going to talk from aircraft to aircraft, but how we're going to get information into the helicopter uh, through uh, digital means. Yeah, and and very capable aircraft. I mean, e- each aircraft within the Air Force and Navy, and Marine, and Army it has different capabilities. But the Air Force, because we are air centric, does seem to put more more capabilities into the aircraft. I mean, you guys have got a FLIR ball on the front, which is very capable. You guys are using tactical data links as well. So it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. And then with that new whiskey model coming out, like I'm pretty excited about that, not just with the, the cool technologies that it has, but you know, with the, the improved engines, improved blades, like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited to fly on that thing just as a JTAC. So (laughs) 
Uh, me too. That the whiskey is gonna change the game for sure for us. Uh, it has a lot of capabilities, just as a helicopter in general. It can its angle of bank. It can go so far to one side and still maintain its uh, airspeed. It's, it's a ridiculous helicopter. It's awesome. Oh yeah, for sure. So with that, what apart from Actually, once you become an SMA, what other kind of like opportunities do you get to have in terms of um, like, okay, so we've got the weapon school, right? And you get to, you get to go on all of these cool syllabus rides. I mean, you guys just got back from Boise, not jealous about that at all. Got to make sure that I hit the next Boise on the next class. But uh, what are some other things that like me and Trent wouldn't even think of and consider that you guys get the chance to do? So I'll kind of start from the uh, basics. So once you get through everything and you become an instructor, uh, a lot of opportunities open up. One of them is going back to Lackland and teaching at COE, so the Center of Excellence. Uh, developing those people as they're just entering is probably pretty rewarding. Uh, you can also go to uh, Kirtland and instruct there, uh, teaching people how to fly on the 60 for the very first time. As we get beyond that, there's a lot of other uh, doors that'll open. So one of them is the test and evaluation squadron at the uh, Nellis Air Force Base currently. So what they're doing is actually taking new Air Force funded material, putting on the helicopter and going out and seeing if it'll work and how it'll work and how we can take that and build on it and use it in, in a CSAR or something uh, larger than that. There's other opportunities out there. So one that is kind of diminishing at the moment was going out to Duke Field and standing up that HH-60 whiskey program itself. They built it from the ground up. There was about five smiles that were on that. It was actually really sweet for them because they got to uh, pretty much design this helicopter, right? Because it was their inputs and then they were saying, hey, we need to fix this or we need to, we need to completely scrap this program. So they got to do a lot of stuff, uh, cool stuff out there too. In terms of outside of... Uh, flying, I honestly don't know of many opportunities. So like once you are flying and you're, you're in it, there's a lot of cool opportunities that open up because a lot of guys have gone to Afghanistan, for example, to uh, do the training air advising program. And they've actually taught uh, uh, the ANA, so the air Afghanistan National Army, they've actually taught those guys how to fly on the helicopter, for example. Uh, and we do that with a few other uh, nations as well. Yeah, but can I go to Ranger School? Sorry, I'm not. I'm not trying to make fun of the questions that we get, but like, why can't I go to Ranger School as an SMA? And then you know, whatever. It's that A at the end of SMA that gets you. You're, <laughs> you're an aviator. Uh, your job's uh, to fly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, I don't really want to get off that. the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we skipped oh, over cool. something very, very important a little bit ago. What, what's do you only shoot the 50 or do you also have the mini guns? Which one's the best? Ooh, uh, somebody's going to watch this and get mad at me. Uh, yeah. so we, sh <laughs> we shoot the, uh, Gal 18 50 cal. We shoot the Gal two mini gun, Gatling mini gun. And we currently shoot the Gal 21 on the H 60 whiskey. Uh, the Gal 18 is a Browning 50 cal developed early 1900s, but it's been, uh, reliable for almost a hundred years. So why get rid of all reliable when our job isn't, we're not there to attack, you know, I'm not, I'm not the guy you're calling for those casts, you know, five lines. I'm, I'm the guy trying to just protect us and the guy we're picking up on the ground. So, uh, Browning 50 cal will always do that job. Uh, we got the 7.62 minigun that's shooting 2000 to 4,000 rounds a minute. It's lights out. It doesn't have great penetration capabilities when you talk about like shooting at trucks or anything like that, but uh, it'll do the job against bad guys. And then uh, we got the soft Gal 21. Targets. Yeah. Yeah, some soft targets. <laughs> uh, we got the Gal 21 as well that's kind of uh, bridging the gap in between the two. And it's roughly a high speed 50 cal, really, when you when you look at it. It does have its issues currently on the whiskey, but it's a uh, a, a larger round that's shooting a lot faster. Uh, in terms of what's the best, I always stick with the 50 cal. That's, that's been my baby since day one. Uh, so I always take that. Got to level reliable, you know, those things are, yep. those things are incredible. And then as, as far as your, your like job description goes, it sounds like you all are, are the, the security blanket, the will be for the pilots, right? 
Like you guys give them the warm fuzzies, you let the pilots pilot and you just kind of take care of everything else. It sounds like, like if there's a problem, like it's your job to solve it. So like, how often do you find yourself in that situation where you're a, a problem solver? Um, and just like getting stuff done, maybe not necessarily on things that you were formally trained in. Yeah, I was, I'd say, uh, where I'm at in space and time right now, uh, instructing and developing weapons officers and developing those advanced instructors at, uh, the weapon school, uh, all the time, almost every flight I'm coming up with an idea of what to do or how to do it. Or, you know, it's, it's easy to say, let the pilots pilot, but when their heads are overloading, they sometimes can't just pilot. So you have to kind of assist them with everything that's going on. And when we look at it from, uh, the macro level and we look at special mission, special mission aviator in general, I would say, yeah, you're, you're there to assist the pilot, right? Because the pilot is the one driving the bus, but the bus isn't going anywhere without you. So you have a lot of responsibilities uh, to make sure that mission happens as well as you have some mission success. Yeah. Well, and how, how do you manage those like relationships, right? Like, uh, you know, enlisted, uh, officer, pilot, you know, security blanket guys, that's you. I just call you guys the security blankets, the whoobies, whatever. Um, how does that work? Cause like, you know, like we, we hear from the outside, like air crew is, is a little bit different with the way that they interact with each other. Like it's a team, but like, I'll let you tell me about it. Yeah. Uh, what we generally say for that is the helicopters and crashing compartments. There hasn't been a crash in a while, so I don't want to scare anybody, but, uh, <laughs> Oh <it>, boy. <laughs> it, you know, it's, we are a team trying to execute the mission and trying to go out there and do that. We obviously still have the professionalism of being in the United States air force and understanding that there is a rank structure and we need to uh, respect that. But once you're in the helicopter, you kind of need to be able to tell, Hey, major so-and-so you're effing this up and we need you to do this better. You know, you, you have to get to that level and that takes time and it takes experience because there's going to come a time where you're the respected person or you're, you're the, the, the go-to and it doesn't matter about your rank at that point. No, that's so true. And that, that, you know, CRM or the crew resource management part of it, you know, that to use the technical term, that's huge. And that, I mean, that really keeps you guys safe. It keeps the folks on the ground safe if you happen to be supporting them. And, um, I mean, CRM has, has saved many a crew. Um, because I mean, cause sometimes you get, you get, you know, tunnel focus and you're just like everything else around you is I'm just focused on flying or I'm focused on shooting a gun at these, uh, these soft targets. And then like, you just lose that situational awareness. So that's, that's huge. Um, so I know, I know Trent, uh, kind of made the joke on, on Ranger school, but like, are there other schools that you guys go to? And obviously being an aviator, you get to go to Messier and all that kind of stuff, but are there any other kind of uh, advanced schools that you guys go to or have the ability to go to? Yeah, there, there's actually uh, quite a few. Uh, when you look at trying to develop as an aviator, I'll just kind of stick with the 60 because it's my forte, but uh, there's a hats school out in uh, Colorado where they actually get to learn how to fly in these high uh, altitude uh, training scenarios that they're the helicopter is not as capable once it gets hot once you get uh, higher in altitude and you get colder and everything wants to kind of you know work against you they actually go out there and fly and learn how to do that those kind of things uh, of course i always throw a, a bone out there for the advanced instructor course that we have going on right now at the at nellis uh, i just tell anybody if you want to be the best you'll come here uh, there's some other uh, opportunities out there, uh, those are more so hush hush. So I don't want to be the one to divulge those, but there's, there, there's some, yeah, cool, yeah, we won't, we won't yeah, hit that. <laughs> there's some, there's some cool opportunities in, uh, in the special. Why are you being so vague, bro? Sure. Just tell us. <laughs> <laughs> it's only going public on YouTube. I mean, like whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I like my job. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm not trying to get fired or lose my security clearance. <laughs> Um, now this is, pr this is probably a difficult question to answer, but I just, it, we received it and I actually genuinely don't know the answer to it, but right around how many SMAs are there in the air force? Uh, in total, 
I believe it's around 400. It's not that many. Around 400? Uh, yeah. And we're divvied up into multiple MDSs, uh, mission design series, so our uh, helicopters, our planes, those kind of things. But I believe it's around 400 special mission aviators. Wow, that's not very many at all. So you guys, very small community, very tight. Everybody kind of knows each other. Very similar to the special warfare community. So that can be good and bad too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have our uh, our guard reserve units that kind of hold on to uh, a lot of our guys, and our guys kind of uh, it ebbs and flows, and it uh, sometimes we'll have a lot, and then sometimes we'll be uh, hurting for people. But yeah, I want to say an average is about four hundred. Everybody knows everybody. Okay. And one of the cool things that you kind of mentioned that uh, again we 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 won't deep dive into it, but you had mentioned kind of doing foreign internal defense with it. Um, I, I would, I would ask you to just kind of lightly hit that because we, we would be skirting some lines. Um, but what kind of things are you guys doing there? You're just going to different countries and then teaching them, um, on their particular aircraft kind of thing. Uh, so a few things I've done, uh, just speaking from my personal experience, I've gone to Brazil and actually talked to them about CSAR and kind of like the basics of combat search and rescue and what we look for and what we're out there to do. Uh, same thing with, uh, in Japan, we, we worked closely with the Japanese and really it's, it's not as much telling them how we do things. It's more so like, Hey, this is what we're looking for. What are you guys looking for? So that we can kind of have that relationship of not only like, this is how they do it, but there might be things that, they're a lot better than us at. So we want to learn from them and we want to develop as well. So it's more so building relationships. Uh, same thing in Korea, uh, same thing now in Afghanistan as that has closed up. But prior to that, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scenarios where you kind of get into it where we just assume, right. Air superiority. And we assume that the air domain is going to be ours, but we can't do that if we're not learning from everybody, we kind of need to know, uh, allies and, not allies or so, uh, how people do things. Yep. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, uh, you're on the road a lot. Another question we get a lot is, uh, you know, if I become a, a SMA, I just like saying it now. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a, a child. <laughs> um, uh, you know, how, how often am I going to be gone? You know, everybody's concerned about their family life and all the other stuff. And obviously it sounds like, you know, you, you met your, your wife in FTAC and now you have a, at least one kid. I don't know. I don't want to give away too yeah. much. I'm sorry. But like you're, you're gone a lot. Can you, can you talk to me about, uh, or talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the ops tempo? Uh, it'll obviously depend where you end up. Uh, and we currently have uh, Moody air force base. We have Nellis air force base. We have Davis Monthan air force base, all of which have different ops tempos. Some units are deploying and a member will deploy for four months every year. Some units are not, and they go TDY, so you're gone two weeks every month. Uh, and some places, for example, are not uh, doing anything currently because they are doing what's called a GRF, and they're kind of just the standby. They're just waiting to see if uh, something happens and rescue has to go and help facilitate that. So it, it depends on where you're at, and that changes as well. Everybody takes all of the squadrons take different duties and it kind of shifts along uh, and everybody takes turns doing certain things, but there'll be times where you're gone a lot and there'll be times where you're, you're not gone at all. Dude, this is unsad. Like you, this is the internet. I need to know how many days per year I'm going to be gone and how often I can see my family and if they can go on TDYs with me, like just, just tell me. No, no. Uh, can they go TDY was- with you? I mean, if you're paying for it. <laughs> yeah, we get some wild questions. No, but w- one of the reasons I brought it up is we we had talked about you you being in Boise and how that's almost as nice as, as 29 Palms. But Peaches, you know what else is in Boise, is one of our favorite companies really that stop. we talk about here. Yeah. And so if you guys are looking for, you know, bags for hunting, for military stuff, just for to go to the office, Everly Stock is one of the best places to go to. They're good personal friends of ours. Uh, vet owned they're they're big supporters of everything that we're about and that you know y'all are about so uh, i'm sure even on the smalls like to have nice bags right i'm pretty sure she's gonna roll you into this ad read yeah yeah that's right (laughs) so 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 head over there use the code uh or uh one zero or ten 
get yourself a discount. Let us uh, let them know that we sent you. Uh, get some of the best bags out there on the market. Uh, the the range that they have, the possibilities that they have, um, uh, are, are pretty ridiculous. So they're, they're good people. Go support them. Support us. Yada yada yada. They're almost as flexible as Smas. You know what I mean? Like the jack of all trades. <laughs> so does a does Tech Sergeant Justin? I forget his last name. Get a lot of heat for the uh, the the video that he had to do. Did you see that that I video? <laughs> no. I did like no, a Google search. No, about. like it was like an official like SMA video. I did like a Google search SMA before we hopped on here just to see what was going on. And so I was going to see <laughs> if you knew that guy about. and you wanted to make fun of him a little bit. Justin Martin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that guy. <laughs> uh, uh, call sign juice. That guy's sweet. Uh, he's doing more important things, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally it's, great it's conversation always... he had, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he said some good things. He was talking about the miniguns. I got all fired up. I wanted to quit my job and go jump onto those 60s and rescue people. It was a lot about rescuing people. So how, how many folks do y'all... Is, is CSR like one of the big things? Like, I guess if I was out there and I was I was listening to this serious question, like when you start binning it up, I'm trying to, to think like an 18-year-old, you know, because we get all these questions like what percentages of all the mission sets do do the folks really focus on? Yeah, that is a really good question. Uh, I would say that we are dedicated uh, to combat search and rescue. What that means is, I'll throw out another uh, old movie, Behind Enemy Lines. If somebody is behind enemy yeah. lines, uh, a pilot downrange, uh, maybe a, a F-16 or something, pilot punches out, that's that's our job. So we, we practice and we train to be as good as we possibly can be to go in, get that person to come out. But there's a lot of other things that, rescue there's that rescue umbrella right and csar just owns a piece of that another piece is casavec so working with uh teams on the ground and uh recovering somebody who may have been wounded with a troops in contact situation uh we get into natural disasters or humanitarian relief so katrina a lot of rescues during katrina uh typhoons out in japan a lot of recoveries out there you know Hurricane Harvey, for example, uh, I had I had just uh, PCS to Japan, but my squadron actually went out to help uh, assist in that. So it's not I don't want to say it's all about combat search and rescue. That is our that is our bread and butter. And that's what we desire to be the best at. But there are other uh, opportunities and uh, situations under that rescue umbrella where you'll get your rescues. Oh, I'm and I'm sure they're busy right now with Ian down in Southern Florida, like you, and you see it, you see it all the time. I forget what the hurricane was that wiped out Tyndall air force base and, and Panama city, but, and then Puerto Rico and all that kind of stuff. Like it, you guys are always busy doing that kind of stuff, that humanitarian efforts. So, um, that can be pretty physical and knowing the folks that are over there in the 34th, I don't see anybody that's kind of out of shape. You guys all seem like you're, you're pretty, stay pretty fit. Uh, so what is the physical kind of not necessarily requirements, but expectations for you guys? Yeah. Uh, you need to be in shape. Everybody can just kind of gloss over that, but it's true. You, and it's not that you need to be this CrossFit, uh, guy who can just lift, you know, 350, do an overhead squat and call it a day. Like you, but you do need to be in shape because the job can not only be tiring, but demanding as you, as you alluded to. One thing that people don't think about is when you're operating the 50 cal or the minigun in that airstream and you're fighting the airstream because you're going 110 knots or 120 miles per hour and you're trying to shoot at the same target. So you're fighting the airstream, but you're fighting uh, to also keep rounds on target. So your, your body is just uh, constantly fighting that airstream. When we work with team members, we have to be able to <laughs> go ahead. What's that? You got a question? No, can you just say Jim Tan Aviation for me? Just Jim. I just want to GTA. <laughs> GTA. That's yeah. what I live by. Jim <laughs> Tan. <laughs> there's a. There's a. We have to load our own ammo. I mean, of course, I don't want anybody loading my own ammo. And multiple 50 cal uh, cans are really heavy. We have to work with uh, our alternate insertion extraction devices. So I talked about that hoist earlier, but we have other ways of getting people in and out. 
one of which is a fast rope. And depending on its length is super heavy. You have to be able to pull that back in uh, most of the time. And another thing we didn't talk about is if not everything's going to be over the land, some things are going to be over the water. And once that rope gets wet, it's heavy and you can't just throw it into the ocean, you know, so you have to be able to pull that back in. Uh, there's a lot of demand, a lot of physically demanding uh, aspects of the job for sure. Or, or I'm just going to throw this out there because it hasn't happened to me, but I've seen it. Um, you know, the, the rope ladder is hanging off the side. You got people rolling in and, you know, we've got, we got a bunch of kit. Like, so I won't say that the dudes get tired, but I have seen it to where people get, you know, with those radios and antennas, they get stuck in some of the, the links or something coming to the aircraft. And you guys have got to reach over and just like yank people up and help them out or help them get unstuck. I mean, I know people have, uh, going out fast roping have forgot to unclip their, their tie, their cow tie <laughs> or their tie in. And so they're kind of hanging like things can go bad. Like I, I'm firm believer that fast roping is one of the most dangerous things we do. Cause there's no safety involved. Like it's, you're just, you better hang on to that rope. You're going to my safety or, sergeant. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, these guys. So make sure you got the right gloves on uh, and, and getting that nice L lockout on a fast rope. But since, and, and you weren't expecting this Snooky, but I'm going to go right into another ad read. So if you need to be physically fit to be a SMA or aspect war, make sure you check out 18 alpha fitness. Um, promo code is the number one ready. And, uh, he's got great training plans for seals, green berets, rangers, aspect war, go check out Kevin. He's got great plans. Um, but I mean, like I'm all jokes aside, like I really have seen a lot of people get pulled up by you guys. I, I gets. I don't want to say right? everybody. I, can I'm do not. It. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. You guys yeah. do it all the time. I don't want to say everybody can do it because there's going to be individuals who just aren't strong enough. But a good majority know that they have to be able to pull people in, uh, whether they're stuck, whether they're just in a bad situation. We need to. We need to get out of that area anyway. So, like, I need you in this helicopter. Uh, yeah, we've. I've, Plenty of times, one arm strength, just not the strongest guy in the world, but adrenaline hits. Sometimes you just pull people. Adrenaline's an amazing thing. I was explaining it to my son the other day. He's like, well, you know, you just kick doors down. I'm like, well, you can't just like, it's a little different than just kicking a door down. He goes, yeah, but when that adrenaline hits, like, like, yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for adrenaline, you know, but <laughs> break your ankle. You still can't just, yeah. So can't just put your foot through a freaking door all the time. Can I can I, I just say too like nephew. oh oh sorry go ahead no I, I was just gonna talk about rope ladders like people don't understand like when that rope ladder comes up over that lip like it's really difficult to get your first the first teammate that's coming up there and he's trying to reach over the top with all of his crap so it's just really really nice when you have uh, an air crew member that's willing to just like yank you up because like if you're the first one up it's your job to help all the rest of your teammates into the helicopter after that but if you're that first guy just to have like an SMA that's like bro I got you. Cause like you just climbed up that whole thing. You are smoked and it's just like, and then you, you, you're like these little finger holds inside the helicopter to try to pull yourself the rest of the way. And I'm just, I guess I'm just saying thank you to the, the great air crew folks out there. The, the smalls that, that help us out. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's plenty of them. Yeah. <laughs> what, Sorry. um, so what, no, you're good, homie. Um, so as we're, as we're kind of approaching the end of all this, right. What would you say? your most favorable part of the job? Like what's the best part of the job? And then what's the least favorable part of the job? I got a feeling I know what's going to be the least, least desirable part of the job, but I like, I don't want to say it. I want you to say it. I might surprise you. Uh, oh, okay. My, All right, cool. The, the best part of the job is rescuing someone. There's getting somebody to go home and see their families, regardless of nationality, regardless of whatever it is and wherever they are uh, taking somebody out of that uh, bad situation and uh, allowing them to not necessarily, it, you know, it doesn't have to be life or death every time, but sometimes they're just in a bad situation. Sometimes it's just hikers out in uh, the middle of Utah that just got lost, you know? So I would say the best part of it is rescuing someone, uh, especially from the HH60 standpoint. Uh, the worst part of, the what I would say on special mission aviator 
on the HH60, for example, is kind of the other parts that go into flying. So there's a uh, admin piece that is on the ground that has not been talked about yet, and that's the keeping us legal, so our documentation. There's the building the flying schedule and making sure everybody's appointments are met and all those kind of things. It's everything that's not flying uh, that pretty much grinds us all out. <laughs> well, well, we just want to fly. Like yeah, but that's an important part of the job, and I think we we run into that sometimes where we'll get new newer folks on team, and it's like, hey, like we have to do these eight hundred things, and you have to be current and qualified on everything before we can roll out the door. And so, like, it's I think it's easy for us to come on here, and I sound like an old guy, like justifying the the giant bureaucracy that we we live in right now. But like, it's important that you have to be like capable of of performing all of those tasks, so you can get to the the fun stuff, so you can get to the flying or the jumping or whatever else that that it is that we want to do. But like, like there's got to be a ton of stuff like your your physicals, all the legalities. Like, can you can you go into some of it a little bit? Yeah, there there actually is uh, quite a lot as a aviator. So you have your currencies. So there's uh, certain time frames that you're allowed to go in between different events, and those events could be just shooting the gun, could be pulling in that fast rope like we talked about earlier. It could be as simple as uh, going out and landing you know that's just called a basic sortie and that's one of our currencies for example we get beyond that and we have these training requirements that can come up every six months every year every two years that can kind of stack on top of each other one of which is kind of like the altitude chamber so it's your physiological uh, capabilities to understand you know that you're um at an altitude where you're not uh getting the same amount of oxygen so you have to be able to understand like hey i I feel different. Uh, and that never happens for helicopters, but it's still currency because we're an aviator, you know? Uh, there's a lot of things as well. Like there's just these simple M9, M4, you know, these, these currencies that we may not need immediately, but you don't want to need those currencies and not have them. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of aspects that go into it of just the flying side of the house. And then you get into your own personal, like you have to have a flight physical every year. You have to, uh, go through all these different appointments. You have to the standard Air Force stuff. You have to have all your shots. You have to do uh, dental, all those kind of things. So those those can compound and uh, be difficult for people to manage uh, early on. Not once you get old like me. You're, it's it's fine. It's all on the same day. One day well, of appointments. <laughs> yeah. So you guys do go to the uh, the altitude chamber. Yeah. Uh, you'll you'll go there. Uh, I believe it's still. Uh, once you're going through basic special, basic special mission aviator and Lackland Air Force Base, that is also when you can do your first altitude chamber, uh, and it's uh, every five or six years. Yep, yep, cool. So, so, and uh, also, I wanted to know, like, how much math is involved? Because sometimes we get questions like, "Hey, what, what should I be good at in school?" And I think when it comes to helicopters, like immediately what I think of as a, a former weather nerd is like your pressure altitude, your density altitude, and you're talking about balancing this helicopter out. There's got to be a, a fair bit of math that goes into making sure that you guys are, are flying safely and uh, efficiently. Yeah. Uh, it's not as much as like being good at math. So yeah, you have to be good at math, but we're kind of in an age where I can pull out my iPad and do the things. So it's not as much about doing math. It's kind of understanding what that math means and uh, why it's important to the helicopter's capabilities, for example. So uh, when we talk about our power capabilities and what our engines are producing, that all goes into our gross weight of our helicopter. That goes into uh, how much fuel we have. All these different elements of numbers are just compounded on each other. And we take that and we can derive that through different graphs and different charts and see what our capabilities are going to be at in each space and time. So our, our turn angle, for example, how long we can fly without getting more gas, how, how, uh, how far we can fly without getting more gas. You know, there's, there's a lot of elements that will go into that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot. So, I mean, we've covered, I think some of the, uh, the physical requirements, you know, the communication requirements, the, the site, you know, your IQ requirements, all that other kind of stuff. Like if, if you can describe like what makes a, an SMA uh, unique, like what would you look for in like the, the perfect teammate? Like what kind of person uh, should, should, you know, the folks out there be looking to be, before they, they walk in that door, you know, to, to make Snooky happy. Uh, I always take a hard worker over anybody. So 
you can get into this, you know, you're really smart, but you don't work hard. That's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, so I would say, uh, a work ethic and you're driven and not only that you want to be the best, not everybody's going to be the flight chief that I had 10 years ago, but, uh, you know, you're, you continually want to get better at what you're doing. Uh, if you have that drive and that work ethic to do that, then instructors like myself can get you to that level of knowledge or get you to that level of performance. You just have to be, you know, not tech sergeant swank, not snooky, not anything. You just have to be that person that wants to work super hard, uh, and just be, just be the best you can be really. No, that's awesome. Um, well then kind of what we do when we have folks like yourself, Snooky, is we, we want to get advice from people and, you know, we haven't had it. You're, you're the first small that we've had on here. So what kind of piece of advice would you give to the 15 to 35 year olds that are out there that, which is what our demographic is that are looking and exploring becoming an SMA, whether it's on sixties, AC 130, CV 22s. If I could give anybody uh, advice about becoming a special mission aviator, I would say do it. First off, I would say do it. It's awesome. Uh, you'll enjoy all of it. Uh, there's these elements that I talked about, like, oh, it's not that fun. But as you already talked about, Trent, like, it's important. So, like, eventually you, you just do it because you have to do it. If I would give you some advice on how to uh, take everything, I would take it day by day. You know, you don't, you you don't want to look two years in the future and be like, I'm going to be this great special mission aviator. You want to be like, I want to be smart in what I'm being taught in this moment. I want to be good at what I'm uh, going through right now at this t in space and time because – yeah, we always want to look to the future and develop and continue to develop, but uh, enjoy the ride. I would say work hard and enjoy the ride. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't know if look, Trent looked like he wanted to add something to that. <laughs> no, it's, that's fantastic. I, that's one of the best, uh, I think, advice you know segments that we've ever got. Yeah, like it's really good. <laughs> that's why I had nothing to add to it. I'm like, yeah, well, you pretty much uh, summed it up. <laughs> Awesome, Stucky. Well, really appreciate you joining us. Um, this has been a long time coming. Like we've we've pinged a couple SMAs that that kind of got cold feet. Um, so really appreciate you getting out there. Which I'm not surprised either, because as one of the instructors at the Advanced Instructor Course, like you're up there talking in front of people all the time, and you're articulate. You can do it. And you've got one hell of a reputation right now. So it's I'll, I'll take it all day long. So uh, again, appreciate you joining us. And then for everybody out there, make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Leave us a review because especially fun ones, like, you know, picking on my height and all that kind of stuff and all that kind of, because it doesn't get old ever. It never gets old. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it hurts, Trent. It hurts. So, all right, everybody out there, thanks again.